This is CNN Breaking News. Hey, good morning. I'm Carol Costello. Thank you so much for joining me. We begin this hour with breaking news as one man fights for his life. Health workers ratchet up the number of people he potentially exposed to Ebola. The old number quadrupled just minutes ago to 80 people. CNN senior medical correspondent Elizabeth Cohen is outside the Dallas hospital with the latest. Good morning. Good morning, Carol. Carol, we are told, yesterday we were told they were following 12 to 18 contacts, and now we're told that they're following around 80 contacts, 80 contacts of the man who is in the hospital right here um, who has been diagnosed with Ebola. What we're told is that many of these contacts are contacts of contacts. In other words, the patient had contacts around him, Mr. Duncan, and that some of the, those contacts then had their contacts and that they're all being monitored, they're taking their temperature, they're watching for signs of Ebola. Carol? Well, describe to us um, how concerned we should be that this number has ratcheted up to 80. You know, I don't find it too concerning because they're doing it as that phrase they love to use, out of an abundance of caution. The people who really need to be concerned are the ones who had close contact with Mr. Duncan, who were exposed to his bodily fluids. I think they really are trying to have a large and a very wide margin of error here, and that's why they've expanded this list. You know, something else interesting just happened, Carol, today, which is that the Texas Department of Health said and told us that four close family members have now been ordered to stay home. They said that these family members were instructed to stay home uh, back on Tuesday, but they said that there were some challenges. The family had some challenges meeting those instructions, and so now they've actually legally ordered them to stay inside their homes until October 19th. It's a little concerning to hear that they had challenges meeting those instructions. You have to wonder, what were they doing? Were they out and about? Were they with other people? Um, those are questions that we asked and were not answered. Interesting. All right, let's head to CDC headquarters in Atlanta and our chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. And that is a concern. These four close family members, they've been ordered to stay inside their home until October 19th. If they leave or violate those orders, they, they may face criminal charges. Why are authorities so concerned? Well, there's two things to keep in mind. First of all, if they're not sick, they're not really a risk to people around them. We've, we've made this point over and over again, but you don't transmit the virus or start to shed the virus unless you're sick yourself. What, that, what this really means is they have to keep a close eye on these folks and see if they start to develop any symptoms. And for whatever reason, as Elizabeth was just saying, they, didn't, they weren't confident in their ability to do that. Maybe, the, maybe these folks weren't checking in to get their temperature checked. Uh, who, who knows? But they said, you know, that, that abundance of caution, they were going to go ahead and just keep them in a place where they could know where they were at all times. And this is going to evolve, Carol, I promise you. Every time we hear about these guidelines, they're always referred to as interim guidelines, and they will evolve. Uh, so right now, this, this is what they plan on doing. But I will tell you that the whole process by which they actually get these patients traced and all that sort of stuff is a pretty laborious one. Take a look at how it all works. In this hospital, Thomas Eric Duncan, the first patient diagnosed with Ebola in the United States, is fighting for his life. We're just hoping and praying that Eric survives tonight, and um, we just uh, we got our hopes up for him. Doctors say he's now in serious but stable condition. Duncan is a Liberian national, and he traveled for the first time ever to the United States to visit his family in Dallas. The New York Times reports that he may have become infected on September 15th. That's when he helped carry a pregnant woman who died from Ebola to the hospital. September 19th, Duncan flies from Liberia to Brussels, Belgium, showing no obvious Ebola symptoms or fever during airport screening. From there, he boards United Airlines Flight 951 en route to Washington, Dallas, connecting to another United Flight 822 to Dallas. September 20th, he arrives in Dallas and heads to this apartment complex to visit family. Four days later, he starts developing symptoms. He walks into this Dallas emergency room on the 25th of September, vomiting and with the fever. He tells the nurse he had traveled from Africa but is sent home with antibiotics and does not undergo an Ebola screening. September 28th, his condition worsens. He returns to the hospital by ambulance and is placed in isolation. 
The next day, a family friend calls the CDC complaining that the hospital isn't moving quickly enough with his test results. By Tuesday the 30th, the lab results confirm the patient has Ebola. The hospital admits it was a failure to communicate among hospital staff that led to the patient's release after his initial visit. He volunteered that he had traveled from Africa in response to the nurse operating the checklist and asking that question. Regretfully, that information was not fully communicated throughout the full team. Now, you know, one thing I want to point out, Carol, th this is going to come up again and again. How do you know who to test for Ebola? W one of the things, obviously, you take this travel history. If a person's been in West Africa and they also have symptoms, it's going to raise your level of concern. But, Carol, take a look at this graphic. We put this graphic together to sort of give you a better idea of how the healthcare teams are going to be approaching this, this, this issue. High risk folks, obviously, with direct bodily contact of bodily fluids. Uh, they're going to get tested no matter what. But look at the next two categories, Carol. It's a lot on that screen, but this is important. Low-risk people, people who may have lived in the same house but did not necessarily have bodily fluid contact, they're going to look at those folks and determine if they are sick, and if so, they may get tested. No known risk. So a person who just comes back from maybe was visiting West Africa but had no contact with anybody with Ebola, likely they're not going to need testing, those folks. But if they're sick for some reason, maybe they didn't know they had come in contact with someone Ebola, so they're going to, they're going to, they may test them because of that. So you get an idea. It's not an absolute thing. If, if you have a fever and travel in West Africa, it doesn't mean you're automatically going to get tested for Ebola. I know it, it just sounds so confusing and that's disturbing. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. Sanjay Gupta uh, live from the CDC this morning. Thanks so much. Also next hour, Dr. Gupta will answer your Ebola questions. Tweet them to us at CNN using the hashtag Ebola Q&A. And of course, we'll get to as many of your questions as possible. There's also word this morning that another patient in Hawaii is undergoing testing for Ebola. Health officials in Honolulu are tight-lipped about the case, saying only that the patient shows symptoms consistent with Ebola and a number of less fearsome illnesses like flu or malaria. The patient is now in isolation and in the early stages of testing. What we've asked the hospital to tell us about is anyone with a travel history and anyone with a fever. And when those two come together, um, we've asked them to be very careful and in an abundance of caution while you're working them up for whatever else might be going on. Um, also make sure you isolate against Ebola just in case that is the case. Health officials won't say whether the patient had recently traveled to West Africa or for how long they've shown these symptoms. The hospital says it is equipped to deal with Ebola if the tests do come back positive. No word on when those test results are expected. So, the big question many Americans are wondering this morning, are U.S. hospitals properly equipped and staffs adequately trained for Ebola? CNN's Kian Law walks us through one hospital's protocol. The first line of defense in containing any sort of potential Ebola outbreak in the United States are our nation's hospitals. We are at Los Angeles County USC Hospital, and this is their emergency room. Like all emergency rooms, there's a check-in. At this particular hospital, a registered nurse does that check-in if you have nausea headache and have traveled to West Africa, this hospital's Ebola virus detection protocol kicks in. You may notice that there are signs all over this hospital asking if patients have traveled in the last three weeks to West Africa. Containment is the key here? Containment is absolutely the key. They'll be brought, depending on how sick they are, maybe by a wheelchair, maybe by a gurney, and then they'll be transported here into the isolation room. What's the first step for healthcare workers? The first step before seeing a patient is always to wash your hands. She puts on a mask, an N95 protective mask, and then she's going to go ahead and put on her protective goggles. She's going to put on a gown that's impervious to water or any uh, bodily fluids. Is this enough protection? This is enough protection. In Africa, of course, they have a very different situation. If I were in Africa, I would also use a much higher level of personal protection. But this is more than enough protection from any of the standard infectious diseases that we see. By recommendations, for Centers for Disease Control, we also have a sign-in sheet. Everyone who enters the room will sign in. This looks like a normal hospital room. 
Well, it is a normal hospital room, other than the fact it has a special air handling system. Let's say the patient vomits on the sheets. What happens to those sheets? Well, it doesn't really matter whether they vomit on the sheets or whether they're just on the sheets. All of the sheets for a patient who has suspected Ebola will be disposed of as biohazardous waste. Are we able to contain Ebola in America? I think that we are. I think the case in Dallas, if the cases before weren't a wake-up call, really has made everyone very aware that all hospitals need to be prepared for the possibility of seeing someone coming from West Africa who has Ebola. So this physician very confident that Ebola could be contained if a suspected case were to come into his hospital. Something else we should point out, Carol, is that he is warning the public they should not be alarmed as well because he does believe that it is very likely that there will be another suspected case walking into a U.S. hospital given the state of international travel. Carol? All right, Kiang Law reporting live for us this morning. Among the people Eric Duncan came into contact with are five children who attend four different Dallas area schools. The school district sent out an automated message to parents alerting them of the situation, but naturally some families are pretty nervous about sending their kids back to school. It has been confirmed that five students may have come in contact with an individual recently diagnosed with the Ebola virus. I don't think I'm going to bring him until, you know, I go to the doctor, check him, and then see if he's okay. The superintendent says the possibility of children contracting the virus is extremely low, but the district is making several changes out of an abundance of caution. In fact, they sent people in, you know, covered from head to toe to scrub down the schools to make sure... I don't know, the schools were cleaned of any bacteria. The events in Dallas are highlighting the fear that some Americans are feeling about the potential spread of Ebola in this country. But is the fear warranted? And how prepared is the United States to deal with such a threat? Shoban O'Connor is the health director for Time Magazine. She joins me now. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So I just want to, like, um, read to you some of the contradictory things that are happening in Dallas right sure. now. So the kids Duncan came into contact with are staying home. Schools are being scrubbed down, but classes will take place today. The ambulance workers who transported Duncan to the hospital, they're free to move about, but the ambulance itself has been taken out of service. Four of Duncan's family members have been ordered to stay home out of an abundance of caution. If they don't stay home until October 19th, they could face criminal charges. But I thought Ebola wasn't transmitted, wasn't an airborne disease, so why would that be? Well, first of all, it's, it's important to make that very, very clear. Ebola is not an airborne disease. It can only be transmitted through contaminated bodily fluids like feces and urine and vomit and blood. So most people don't, in general, day-to-day -day contact, you do not come into contact with those things from another person. So I think what's happening here is there was a blunder when the the Dallas case was first sent home on September 20, 26th, and now it's kind of playing catch up and course correction. So why, why wasn't a protocol put into place in every American city in light of the fact that two American doctors, I guess one was an aid worker, another was a doctor, were treated in Atlanta for Ebola? Right. I mean, the CDC's protocol is, it has been very clear from day one, which is that people traveling from West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea in particular, um, who present with flu-like symptoms during flu season don't discount the, the, the possibility that they, that they may have Ebola. And that is what happened here. I mean, there was, there was a mistake. Hopefully this will bring to light the urgency of every case being presented taken seriously. How long will it take cities across America to get it together? My suspicion is that this is getting enough attention that people will be on high alert. I mean, this virus can be contained. We do know how to contain Ebola. And unlike in West Africa, where, you know, it's completely out of control and the resources are not there to contain the virus, we have the healthcare system to do that. So we need to follow the steps, which is, you know, isolate immediately, contact trace, which is why, you know, the, the people who had been in contact with the gentleman in Dallas are being monitored and questioned and in some cases asked to stay home. Um, those are the things that need to be done for 21 days, which is the incubation period for Ebola. Well, I want to go back to these, these four close family members who are being ordered to stay in their home. Sure. That just seems, I mean, I understand the fear, I do, 
but it seems extreme to me. And nobody's explaining why these people have been ordered to stay inside their homes until October 19th. Right. I suspect that as the day goes on, more information will come out. Um, I think it's it's very important. Um, one thing that uh, about Ebola is that it it fear of Ebola is far more contagious than Ebola itself, and so. The more questions that are left sort of hanging in the air about well, how, how contagious are these people? Does this mean they're sick? Why do they need to stay in their home? Will there be blowback for them being told to stay in their home? I think answers are going to have to come out fairly quickly about this one. Shabon O'Connor, thank you so much for being thank with you. me. I appreciate it.